I'm fighting with the microphone. It's a bit okay. fighting with the slides, fighting with the microphone. Right. I don't have a clicker. Hi. It's a bit of a controversial uh, speech that I'm going to make here. This is a design conference, and it's always scary for me to do this in front of so many designers. Um, Yasha Athena. Give me Yolanda. Give me Spanida. Full, 100%, not half. Full Spanish. Αλλά έμεινα στην, στην Ελλάδα για 7 χρόνια και γι' αυτό μιλάω σπαστά ελληνικά. Like uh, the presenter says, I'm the director of service and platform design at Farfetch. And uh, I'm aware that platform design is a concept that uh, probably a lot of you haven't heard uh, much yet. Uh, Farfetch, how many people know what Farfetch is? A few people. Right, it's a luxury retailer. We do e-commerce for luxury brands. Um, a lot of people come some places, and when I go, I do conferences where I talk with clients. Oh my God, we really love their website. Well, that's not what I do. I would like to take credit, but not my business. I am on the back. I'm a tooling designer. Um, I'm a systems thinker. I'm a, that weird designer in between engineering and design. Uh, and I have been for a very, very long time. Um, I've been designing... Oh, that's too early. <laughs> I've been designing uh, interfaces and tools for over 20 years. I started uh, doing fighter pilot <coughs> interfaces in the US many, many years ago. I stopped doing it because I don't believe in war, obviously. Actually, I did it for two weeks, but it's cool to say that I did five or five interfaces. <laughs> when I realized what I was doing, I was like, no, I'm out of here. Um, and then I just fell in love with back office tools, with uh, all those interfaces that take very little love from designers, with those interfaces that people actually use for eight hours a day, not with the commercial type of apps and interfaces that you know, customers see for 15 minutes and get all the credit and all the love. I love doing train management uh, interfaces and the land registry interfaces and all of those really cool systems and really complicated uh, um, uh, transactions that, uh, that don't get seen so much. So that's how I ended up doing ecosystems. I've worked for banks, retailers, for open source uh, operating systems like Ubuntu. I work for Hertz magazines. I did the whole ecosystem design for, um, for Hertz magazines where every single publication across the world was in a different uh, CMS, or in, but in several different CMSs, um, <laughs> and ended up all in one. So 380 digital magazines um, in 16 countries uh, now share data, uh, content, uh, analytics, um, and, and, and marketing all into one system. So when there was no communication, now everything is connected. So my love for designing ecosystems actually was born <laughs> in Greece. While I was here, I founded and owned a small digital agency called Olimon. And this was my pride and joy. It was uh, a TV series. I don't know if they played this thing. Has anybody actually watched Explore, Explore Nautilus in the sky? No one. <laughs> wow. Popular. <laughs> it was a TV series, 10 episodes of Under the Water uh, documentary, similar to um, Cousteau documentaries. So that is where I, I actually started to love um, ecosystems. Ecosystems as a, as a concept of how everything is connected, not only in nature, but in the real world. And how I realized over the last 10 years where I have been practicing digital ecosystem design, something really, really important. And is that user-centered design is completely obsolete. It has worked for a very long time. 
But it doesn't work anymore. When we need to be looking, when we design anything, any of our products, we need to be looking at the non-users, at the service things that are going to take care of the after uh, effects of our products, and the environments and context where our products live. We have to look beyond. There is something happening in the world right now, right? And all of you are feeling it. All of us are feeling it. We're moving. There is a change. We're moving from that kind of um, egoistic um, type of, of world where we were just thinking of our own profit and our own things, over consumism, individualism, us, 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 me, 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 to a, a beautiful world where we're starting to think that you know the environment needs to be protected, that mental health is important, that how we live in this world and what we leave behind us is important. We don't, we're less centered in ourselves. We're starting to look at shared economies and circular economies and things that make us collaborate more with each other and think a little bit more on the people around us. Does this thing that I'm doing has an impact? And what is that impact? But as designers, for many, many years, at least for all the years I've been a designer, which is plenty, um, we've been indoctrinated in user-centered design. It is the cornerstone and the center of our education. Think of the user, believe in the user, test the user, listen to the user, is the user. Center, focus in one user, do your personas, do your exercises. However, that hyper-focus has taken us to a place where we end up just doing features, moving buttons, creating screens. All of this agile speed, all of this getting the MVP product in a couple of months, some features in two weeks, is making us just looking at the very, very smallest life of the problem. It's making us focus on something very small. And it doesn't give us time or space to look at surround us. That type of um, hyper-focus and the discipline of user-centered design, the discipline of design, user experience, UI, uh, design thinking, and so on, has made design and designers grow. We've grown a lot. From when I started, that I had to fight for every single headcount that I got, that I had to fight for every project where design got involved, from when design got involved into the project, to get it earlier and earlier, to a world we have now where design sits on the board. There are chief experience officers, there are chief design officers. <laughs> There are directors of design and VPs of design and so on and so forth. We have a right really high and we have made, created incredible products. We've made amazing progress in designs. However, we haven't solved any of this. None of this has been solved. It's very, very difficult pro uh, problems to solve, right? Hunger, environmental degradation, discrimination, climate change. We hear this every single day. And as designers, we're doing nothing to fix it. But also, where is worse? Are we making it worse? Are our designs actually making a lot of these things worse? The fact is, it is. We are. I love the design teams at Uber and at Uber. They have fantastic design teams, they have won awards. Uh, I happened to have done this talk in Ireland, in Dublin, uh, a few weeks ago. And actually the VP of product design of Uber was talking after me. And he's a lovely man and I love, I mean, I have admired him as a designer and as a design thinker for years. You know, he's really, really famous and an amazing, an amazing designer. And he was speaking after me. And I was going to bash Uber, like I'm going to do now. <laughs> and he was talking after me, and I thought, oh my god, I think I'm going to take this slide out and, and not, and not uh, criticize Uber, because he's going to talk after me. But then 
I thought, why not? What I'm saying actually about Uber is a fact. What has happened is that by hyper focusing on the user problem, right? The problem that Lyft and Uber were trying to solve is for people to be able to get a car fast and conveniently. They also wanted to solve the problem of sharing uh, cars. And they thought the hypothesis was that by making it so easy, people will share more cars and therefore they will actually um, fix a little bit the problem of traffic. The reality is that since Uber and Lyft and any other car sharing uh, company has come out, traffic has increased in some cases up to 62% in the cities where they operate. It has also reduced the amount of people that use public transport. So it is creating a huge environmental problem, a huge traffic problem, because Uber completely concentrated on solving a user problem, which they did perfectly. Matter of fact, they are a very successful company. But they didn't think of the effects of this. <laughs> I love having the logo while I'm watching. Um, they didn't think of the non-users. They didn't think of the effect that that success was going to have. And the fact is that the rest of us, well, you, you Athenians and, or Greece is, is uh, lucky because you don't have Uber, actually. Um, I was very surprised to find to book an Uber yesterday and find a taxi coming to my rescue from the Uber app. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. In Spain, you can get an Uber or a taxi. Great. In London, you just take, you just get the Ubers. Um, so, the, the problem has been gotten worse because they concentrated on, on a slide of a problem and didn't look at the environment. My other favorite one. I have plenty of examples and a few one later because I can't be talking about this forever. Another example is the coffee pots. I'm not going to call them Nespresso anymore because there are so many kinds right now that they are not anymore Nespresso pots. How many of you actually use this, uh, these captions for your coffee every day? A lot. Almost all of you. Those were an amazing innovation. Incredible. Now you can make a coffee that is tasty, that you can have about five, six, seven, ten flavors in your kitchen. You can have a different one anytime you want. You can have a party with many people and give them any type of coffee in one simple click and a push of a button. Those are one of the biggest environmental hazards that we have right now. Even the inventor of the coffee pods has recognized that. It's so bad that the city of Hamburg has started to forbidden, has started, has forbidden the use of uh, coffee pod machines on the public buildings uh, of Hamburg. And it's not the only one. More and more cities are doing so. These pods, although now they are being try, trying to make them uh, recyclable, <coughs> most of the cases they're not. So by trying to solve a simple user problem or a simple uh, use case, which is I want my users to have very convenient coffee that is easy to make and you don't have to open a coffee bag and put it on the coffee machine and wait uh, for the coffee machine to happen. It's just clean, simple, and it has a lot of choice. Two things have happened. We have created a lot more waste because even if it's recyclable, you're creating the waste in the first place and you still have to recycle it, which waste is energy. And two, has made the coffee incredibly expensive. Has any of you calculated how much more you're paying for those coffee, for the coffee on your coffee pots? About 10 times more for the amount of grams that you get for the coffee. So it has done. <laughs> I talk too much and I don't move fast enough, but do I? <laughs> right. Um, again, so to focus on, on, on a problem for the user, we have created an environmental problem we have to deal with later. So what can we do? I'm going to stop depressing you. I mean, we have created modern slavery by wanting to have our Amazon deliveries on 24 hours. It's a fact. We have created schizophrenia, 
and paranoia and incredible mental uh, issues in teenagers and children because of social media. Even myself, I get paranoid and stressed because I have an app on my phone that tells me for how many minutes I should brush my teeth. <laughs> what the hell, right? We have so many apps on our phones that now we need apps to manage our apps. <laughs> so, what's, you know, we, we want to solve things. What we do to solve this is to stop looking so close. Start looking at the big picture. Looking at the user and the user problem is great, but you need to start looking at where that, that problem lives and what is the relationship. Designers have to start looking a lot more at the interconnectedness of things, how everything is related to each other, right? This is the only quote I have on my presentation. I'm not fond of text anyway. Um, but this is important because it's this definition. Interconnectedness is about reduction of friction between interactions in large scale systems. This helps us move beyond the concept of a user and embrace the concept of relationships and interaction between peers and their ecosystem as the key element of the business. Yesterday, I was flying from uh, London and in the magazine of, uh, of British Airways, which is fantastic, the, the business life, there was an article on blockchain. And it was, there was a paragraph that actually took a picture and sent to my team saying that any business in the future that doesn't live in an ecosystem will not be able to exist at all. Because the world is becoming so complex and relationships in between companies so important that everything will be interconnected in these ecosystems. So studying and understanding the relationship in between things is becoming more and more important. And that unit user is starting to be less and less important. <coughs> Sorry. The only way I have to explain to you how ecosystem design works is giving you some examples of how we do it at Farfetch. I don't like tooting our own trumpets, but it's the, it's the closest example I have right now. How we look at the Farfetch ecosystem is this way. I've tried to explain it many times, many ways. I've used metaphors of a garden, for example, and ecosystem designers being gardeners. Uh, but this is my favorite one. Uh, thinking of an ecosystem as a city, right? In any city, in any zoning design or urbanistic design, or however you call it, you have the infrastructure, right? In any city. It's the streets, the sewers, the electrical wires, all the, all the pieces that actually allow the city to exist. The power, the businesses within the city. That is the technology that powers our ecosystem. That's how we manage it. On top of the infrastructure, we have, of course, the business. The businesses, the applications that make the world move, they make the ecosystem. The apps and the business units and the infrastructure uh, company providers, actually, the logistics and everything else that sits on top of it. <coughs> And then is the community. Everyone, all the humans that operate within those businesses that live in that infrastructure, exchange the value in between each other. So that's how we divide the Farfetch ecosystem and how we work on it. And this is an example of a slice, a vertical slice of how we think of ecosystems, right? At the moment, we have only the business ecosystem. We are thinking of other, other types in Farfetch, but for now, we only have that one working on. We have the business ecosystem on top of everything, or under everything, if you want. And on top of that exists the marketplace platform. But it's not the only platform where we have the Farfetch. We also have data platforms, infrastructure platforms, and other types. Actually, recently, we just uh, acquired a company called NGG, you guys group that owns um, of, of white brand. Um, and they have another platform different to Farfetch. So we have several platforms within an ecosystem. 
within every platform, we also have multi-channel services. So we have all the services that power that, from supply to logistics, production, uh, product upload, you name it. Tons and tons of our APIs and services that power all the, all the transactional uh, within the uh, platform. And then we go to the single touch point, upload a product mm -hmm. uh, or a piece of documentation. And that's how, that's how we see the relationship in between the layers of the platform. <laughs> For us to be able to look at things in such a high view, we have to get away or kill personas. Together we're saying that user-centered design is not good. Killing personas probably is the second most controversial and uh, most difficult thing to say. When I actually pitch it for the first time to my far-fetched team, they all were really worried. They thought that somebody completely not case had come to, to run the team. They thought, okay, if we're not doing personas, what do we do? What are we actually studying when we are, when we are doing ecosystem design? Because we are looking at such a big problem, we cannot be looking at something so small as one user, no matter what. And we look at entities. We call them actors of coverage. They are, as you can imagine, in such a huge ecosystem, such a vast platform, because we do everything from design to returns, right? We cover all the areas of uh, retail and creation. We have hundreds and hundreds of, of users customers, clients, creators, curators, all types. But they all join into these entities. The Farfetch entities are four groups, six entities. Producers, consumers, aggregators, and governors. And in between those are merchants, service providers, customers, application owners, shapers, and stakeholders. To do this kind of reduction of the complete vast array of our um, users, we work for months. This seems like super logical now and makes complete sense, but we started with 27 actors originally. So by actually interviewing different areas of the business, we started to put them together and simplifying the groups that we dealt with. to be able to deal with a lot bigger but simplified units. How we separate or how we actually do something uh, as vast as thinking of, uh, of uh, the system design, we use service design. And this is the, the example to explain how platform and ecosystem design is uh, organized into service design teams for example, uh, the service of onboarding and integrating, or the service of digital production, or merchandise management, and how UX is related to that. So if you think this is the, the ecosystem, the platform, does the service, does the touch point. So in onboarding and integrating, we have UX teams doing business development and documentation. And we have, in digital production, we have people looking at planning and looking at tools. We do do user-centered design at that level. At the, at the touch point level. But for us to be able to do that, we had already done a ton of work at the service level and even more work at the platform level. We look at it a bit like this. We use service design, which is another discipline of, how many of you are service designers here? Or consider yourself service designers? <laughs> Not very popular discipline here in Greece, I guess. Right. Service design uh, looks <coughs> at the relationship in between interactions. So it's a step, in a middle step in between ecosystem design and touch point design. We use service design to actually explain to the whole company how the platform works. <coughs> this microphone is very interesting. To be able to drive operational change, because when we change the, the world from looking at the very small slices, we got killed uh, of uh, the personas, 
and we started to give service maps to the product owners instead of uh, wireframes, and started to talk about much bigger areas of the business, they didn't understand why we were doing that. So we had to service design the change in the organization. So after we, we look at the different elements of our company, we realized that nobody understood what really was a platform. So during three months, we created a roadshow, and we educated the 3,500 employees of Farfetch across six different countries in what a platform is, and why do we do platform design, and what is an ecosystem, and why, if we go back to this slide, why everybody in the company is a shaper. The platform belongs to everyone, and everyone and it is, has the responsibility to actually shape how the ecosystem works. For us to do that, we had to actually use service design to change the operations of the company. The way we do, uh, why we do ecosystem design, which is the level higher of the platform, is to simplify the complexity of a very, very difficult system. When I arrived to Farfetch, I was presented with this slide. This is Farfetch two years ago. All of this, in that corner over there, are the different merchants, companies, brands that we work with, that exchange uh, supply and demand. Here, we have companies that uh, provide us with third-party tools. Over there, we have companies that work with us, but are not into our marketplace. So we actually provide them with tools and, um, and data, but they don't sell it through us. And over there, we have solutions. We also provide solutions to other companies, and we do white label uh, tools. So trying to think of all the transactions and all the uh, interconnectedness of that as it is was impossible for me. We worked for months until we simplified like that. You already saw how our actors were defined. This is how the actors connect in between each other. This is the value exchange in between the entities of our fetch. We took that complexity of the ecosystem and reduce it by, by creating the entities, and then found out how they are related to each other and how they are related to the platform. In the center is a platform. The center of the center is data. We have all the services around. And then here is the uh, <coughs> supply, the demand, and here is the supply. And there is the partners, the service providers, the sellers, and here are the consumers. And on top, we have the stakeholders and the shapers. We manage, after interviews, workshops, and, and a lot of um, hours of reduction, to make something that look at the beginning like a, a complete universe, circles everywhere. We just started with hundreds and hundreds of different companies and the relationship between them into something that it was so simplified that everyone in the company understands. This is now the, uh, the, the desktop uh, picture that we put as a, as a standard in every computer in the company. So people can understand what our fetch is. In practice, it means that we, divide, we separate our, our teams into three areas. Not the whole team, of course, are ecosystem designers. We have ecosystem designers, we have service designers, and we have UX and UI designers. The most of the team, which is at the moment about 87 people, are US and UI designers. They do look at the design, they, do, they use personas, they have user-centered design, but that user-centered design and those personas are anchored on um, entities, on actors, and they understand very well where the relationship and the value exchange of those entities and those actors happen. And all of those entities and actors live in an ecosystem, and how the ecosystem gets governed is also very clear. So by when we design down the feature, we know very well how everything is related. So if we are doing a new returns feature, we know that those returns are actually uh, affected by the logistics area. It makes for us to, to actually uh, work long hours and having to always look higher, but you also help us to reduce everything. 
We always also look at how we are trying to make our operations uh, cheaper and faster to make sure that we reduce our carbon footprint and the waste that we produce. So we have created things like, uh, well, we are looking at things like a, a blockchain to trace all of our products to be able to sell them secondhand with trust. Because the biggest problem in luxury secondhand selling is trust. When you have bought the Fendi bag and you don't know where it's coming from, uh, you doubt it twice to buy it secondhand. So now we, we do it, uh, we're using blockchain to be able to make sure that people know that the Fendi bags are, um, are original and like this, sell less and reduce waste. But this is, this is how we actually relate everything. Takeaways, please look beyond the user. Don't focus only on that small slide, that, that uh, feature. Look higher, think of the long-term impact. What you're doing, what, the feature that you're designing, the product that you're designing, the new interaction, has an impact on the platform that it's designed on and the ecosystem it lives. Either your company ecosystem or the broader one. And always tries to reduce the friction. Not only the, the natural friction in between things, but every type. Socioeconomical, mental, environmental. We are not alone in this planet. As designers, we cannot continue thinking that whatever we do has no impact. We are very, very powerful. And we need to take our responsibility seriously. <coughs>